complexity. In truth, Douglas Miller did not really believe in the beauty of the English language. The four hours a week spent studying the subject were wasted time to this unremarkable boy of 15. Why study something that people used every day without thinking? At least with French or German or Italian, there was some knowledge involved, some hard facts. But to study his own language was like studying chewing or standing up. Language was a tool. Books were what you read on the beach when the sun was too bright for the screen on your phone. Of course, Douglas Miller knew not to say this kind of thing out loud, and certainly not to Mr. Arnold, his sour, tobacco-toothed English teacher. But this is what he thought each week as he sat and stared unseeing at the pages of Pride and Prejudice to kill a mockingbird, or worst of all, the love sonnets of that clown Shakespeare. My mistress' eyes are nothing like the sun. Coral is far more red than her lips red. If snow be white, why then her breasts are done. If hairs be wires, black wires grow on her head. Hugo Barrett, the class's self-appointed performer, was reading the poem aloud in that fluty, lilting voice of his, all swoops and glides, tossing his poet's hair, widening his eyes coyly at the word breasts to the delight of the arty, pretty drama girls who sat drinking in his performance, chins cupped in their hands at the sheer depth and beauty of it all. Douglas felt the chewed end of his biro crack between his teeth and turned instead to the sports field where a scrappy, half-hearted soccer match was being played by sodden third years, shoulders hunched uselessly against the rain. It resembled a scene from a prison film, yet even that would be preferable to poetry. Miller? Mr. Miller? If I can drag you away from the match for one moment. Douglas felt the suck of his hand on his cheek as he jerked straight. Uh, could you repeat the question, sir? giggles in the front row. The bard, he grinned. Mr. Arnold was the kind of teacher who delighted more in his pupils' failures than their success. Please paraphrase into good modern English his meaning in the first quatrain, by which I mean, anyone? The first four lines, snapped Hugo Barrett. Indeed, the first four lines. So, Douglas. Douglas scanned the words. He means, he means his girlfriend is nothing special. Thank you, Mr. Miller, drawled Mr. Archer, verbally patting him on the head. You have the soul of a poet. Douglas cursed Shakespeare under his breath, bit down hard on his biro, and tasted ink on his lip. An average boy of average ability, Douglas swam in the middle stream of an adequate school, causing neither anguish nor excitement in his teachers or fellow students. Of medium height, his hair was somewhere between brown and beige, his complexion averagely flawed for a 15-year-old boy. His face... Well, in the unlikely event of Douglas committing a crime, the witnesses would have a hard time describing his face, his features tending towards a not unpleasant flatness. He looked like a boy, thought like one too, sometimes happy, often sad, occasionally filled with fear, anxiety, shame, rage, confusion, and lust, all of which he did his best to conceal. In his quiet moments, of which there were many, Douglas sometimes felt nostalgic for the earlier years of his childhood, long days that revolved around TV and action figures and model kits, rather than this far more troubling controversies of friendship, popularity, girls, desire. But now adolescence was working through the year like scarlet fever. You could smell it in the corridors. This was the chrysalis stage, personalities forming beneath oily, broken skin. One boy was transforming into the class comedian, another the heartthrob, this girl the genius, another the heartbreaker. The athletes performed their push-ups and squats. The actors and arty types noisily found their voices, their rich inner lives and poetic souls. In the music rooms, there were outbreaks of singing at lunchtime. Yet Douglas remained a blank. He never expected to be hoisted aloft on the shoulders of his schoolmates, but neither did he expect to be flicked with wet towels. The laws of physics meant that no human being could ever be invisible, but still Douglas tried. Then, with the new term and the spring, Miss Vishnesky arrived. Everything about Miss Vishnesky was different. The defiant buzz of the Miz and the bundles of high-scoring consonants in her name as she spelt it out on the whiteboard, the way she perched on the head of her desk rather than hiding behind it, the way her dark eyes took them in, one by one, all of them, not just the poets and actors on the front row. 
Good news and bad news, I'm afraid. The bad news is that Mr. Arnold won't be teaching you this term. Ill health has meant that he'll be taking some time off. He may return, he may not, but while he's gone, you'll be in my hands. That, in case you hadn't realized, was the good news. The class laughed, and Douglas Miller laughed too. They turned once more to Shakespeare's sonnets. Let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediment. Love is not love which alters when it alteration finds or bends with the remover to remove. He watched her as she read, book held high, pinched between finger and thumb like a chorister. She was fairly old, 28, 30 maybe, with black hair cut in a geometric bob and skin the color of... He couldn't think what her skin reminded him of, but her name suggested there was something European about her, East European, Polish, or Russian, maybe. Perhaps it was the eyes, fractionally wider apart and surrounded by dark skin, or the pleasing, wide planes of her face, the kind of face you'd see in a spy film beneath a fur hat. Love's not time's fool, though rosy lips and cheeks within his bending sickle's compass come, Perching on the desk, she tugged and twisted at a long, tight skirt in some kind of heavy, dark grey material, tapering tightly to the calves, drawing attention to ankles which were dark-skinned and dappled with the kind of bruises and cuts that you get from bicycle pedals. Through the toes of her elegant scuff shoes, the red of her nails matched the colour of her lipstick. Lipstick. She wore lipstick to class. What was she doing here amidst the bad skin and awful hair, the atmosphere of cabbage and coffee breath and overactive glands? Love alters not with his brief hours and weeks, but bears it out even to the edge of doom. And she was pretty, of course, but not magazine pretty, the magazines that Douglas stacked in piles beneath his bed. To the extent that a 15-year-old boy could be said to have such a thing, Miss Vishnesky was not Douglas's type. With her round, soft body, it was hard, for example, to imagine her playing volleyball, though he would no doubt try later. But to sit and look at her on a damp Tuesday afternoon, to drink in her face and her voice, a confiding musical English or alto, like a voice you might hear on a radio late at night, or even better, a voice you might like to hear in your ear, close and warm, well, that wasn't so bad after all. He rested his head on his hand and closed his eyes, and actually listened. You're not asleep, are you? You there? I'm sorry, I don't know your names yet. He realized that she was talking to him. Uh, Douglas, miss, Douglas Miller. Douglas, have I put you to sleep already? She was smiling with tight lips, mock scolding him. No, I I was just listening. Yeah, right, smirked Hugo Barrett. So what did you think of the poem, Douglas? 